Christmas is over, which Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And now we are post-Christmas, uh, post that celebration, and we're really in a day that prophecy has become history, really, uh, the day of Christ's birth, so almost 2,000 years ago. That day is when prophecy from hundreds and thousands of years earlier was fulfilled and now is actually history. So we're going to look at some of that today. Um, before we get to that, I'm going to be using different Bible passages. If you want to follow along with your Bible, be prepared to flip around a little bit. Um, some good stuff. Uh, before I get to that, some of you may remember Sylvia Brown. Yeah, Sylvia Brown was on TV quite a bit. She was on Larry King Live and different shows. She wrote, uh, from what I figured out, 45 books, although some places it lists more than 45, so I'm not sure if there are different versions of the same book or not. Uh, and she was a modern-day self-proclaimed medium with psychic abilities, and medium means that she would talk to dead people and such. And you, you may remember her for that, because she would go on shows and she would call somebody from the audience and then she'd start talking to their dead, whatever, and tell them things about themselves. And um, she was pretty good at it, and she became very wealthy in that. And uh, she had passed away back in 2013. Interestingly, her son, who has a completely different name, it's not, his last name is not Brown, uh, he's doing the same thing now, traveling around doing that type of thing. So I, I mentioned her because uh, I read one of her, or I listened to one of her books on audio, on audio called End of Days, when I was researching like the end of times and stuff like that. And I wanted to use a lot of different sources to see what was out there. And the interesting thing about that is, um, in that book, she made many predictions, probably about 20 predictions that she put dates on. And all, in fact, every one of them, as far as I could tell, was wrong. She got every single one wrong, and that, that, that's pretty hard to do. You think you'd get lucky and hit one or two. Uh, but I remember like one of them, to give you an idea of the prediction she made, she said that by the year 2015, it was something like that, give or take a year, the common cold would be cured. That if you felt a cold coming on, or if you had a cold, you would go to your doctor's office, go in this booth for seven or eight minutes, and you'd come out and you'd be cured. Well, I can tell you that that has not happened, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, but it's fascinating because uh, you know she was predicting these things, and you know we are fascinated by that. You know we are approaching New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, and if you watch TV, depending on what channels, and you know, we only get the basic 12 channels or whatever, plus some odd, odd channels, uh, you'll see people being interviewed with their predictions. What's going to happen in 2022? And you hear a lot of different things, and we're really interested as people, generally speaking, to listen to those predictions. Uh, one, thing about, one thing Sylvia Brown said, I want to get back to her for a second. She said, if you are afraid to die, you will not fully live. Now, that actually was a pretty good prediction for the day we're in now, because there are many people who are just hunkered down in their houses. They don't call for anything at all, except things they absolutely have to go down to. We have had multiple people in our church that went to their doctor, and their doctor said, don't go to church until COVID is over. Now, if you listen to your doctor, and those are his instructions, you may never come back to church. Now, we don't know. Maybe a year from now, COVID will be over, but it seems to me it's more likely to be like the common cold or the flu that it just keeps coming back in different varieties. Uh, but we don't know. And I think of my dad. We're going to go visit my dad tomorrow. He's 96. He, he has a bad heart. He has bad lungs. His kidneys are barely working. He has an aneurysm that, you know, is largely inflated. And not like any day, maybe his last day. And he really doesn't have much of a quality of life. He sits in his chair and he gets up and goes to the kitchen and, you know, does what he needs to do and nothing much more. He only leaves the house when he has to, usually for a doctor's appointment or to go to the hospital. Uh, <coughs> and if you think of the life my dad is living, there are people just like me and you who are choosing to live like that because they are so afraid of COVID. If I go out, I may catch COVID. It may kill me. I may be miserable. I may get sick. I may give it to somebody else that may die or get sick. And, you know, I can't tell anybody what to think. We all have our own, op own opinions, right? But I can tell you this. Don't listen to Charlie. Listen to Jesus. Look at what he did and what he said. So, like this Christ candle, 
If we look at the word of Jesus and the actions of Jesus, when he lived on earth, there were many times he went out into harm's way knowing that he could be beaten, that he could be arrested, that he could be killed. And he knew that would eventually come. But even then, if you look at his apostles, you know, I think every one of them died a martyr's death. In fact, we have their shields up on the thing. You know, some of them were stoned to death, some of them were crucified, some of them were, you know, stabbed or whatever. Um, they didn't shirk from that. They went out, read, read through the books that Paul wrote. Man, he was beaten, he was flogged, he was arrested, thrown in jail, in shipwrecks, etc. But he kept going out. Even though every time he went out, his life was at risk. He knew people wanted to kill him. People wanted to harm him. But he did not shirk from death because he knew he had to live life. We have this one life to live. Don't waste it now. If you've been hunkered down in your house, almost two years you've been hunkered down in your house. If COVID only lasts for two more years, that's four years of your life that you really didn't live the way God intended you to live. Live your life. Make good decisions. Be smart about it. And you are making life and death, death decisions every day. This year, I just checked, I have done six end-of-life services this year. I think one of them, the person died from COVID complications, which was this past week. It's going to happen. But you know what? I think the other five died from things that weren't COVID. We all will die. And if you believe that God knows the day that you're going to die, live your life. Do it smartly. Do it wisely. Make good decisions. Man, but don't stop living because you're afraid to die. So I think that's a good thing she said. She put that on from what I read. Uh, Sylvia Brown put that on her Facebook page shortly before she passed away. So if you think about predictions for the new year, um, if I asked all of you, write down some predictions for the new year. Like everybody give me five. And if you sat there long enough, you could make predictions, right? They're guesses. Like I could predict, um, and there are different ways you could predict things. You could just like pick something crazy, like, oh, I predict that there's gonna be an earthquake out on the west coast and California is gonna break off, right? It's gonna happen. Yeah. It's just a matter if it's this coming year or you know, thousands of years off, we don't know when. It's gonna happen, right? Uh, but that would be a flyer. I would be more likely to go with statistical probability and say something like, there will be another variant of COVID next year. That would be a pretty safe one, right? Because COVID has been around almost two years. We've seen multiple variants, that most recent one, Omicron or whatever it's called. So that would be a pretty safe prediction. And you, know, you can make all kinds of predictions. And if we all made like five of them, some of them would be right. In fact, maybe somebody would get more than one right. But if you did, it would be because you either guessed intelligently, like didn't say things like California's gonna break off, more like there's a COVID variation, you know, so you went safe, or maybe you just got lucky. Because most of us probably would get all five wrong. They're predictions. In other words, they're guesses. Now guesses could be just wild guesses, or they could be based on some knowledge base that you have. So it might surprise you about predictions but the Bible doesn't give any predictions. Some of you have read the whole Bible. Probably all of you have read parts of the Bible. There are no predictions in the Bible. What there are, are prophecies in the Bible. So what's the difference between a prediction and a biblical prophecy? Well, a prediction is a guess. California's gonna break off. That's a guess, right? Well, if I just, well, it is, it's just a guess. But, a biblical prophecy is from God, given to a prophet who recorded it, wrote it down, and it's in this book. If it's from God, and God says, this is gonna happen, it will happen. In fact, hundreds of them have happened. You can do the research, you can go on the internet, Google it, fulfilled prophecies, and you will see many of them are very specific and very detailed. Other ones are kind of vague, and sometimes I read, you know, you know, other people, what they determine are fulfilled prophecies. I'm like, well, that's a real stretch to say that. And some of them are that way. But if you look, some of them are very specific uh, with great detail. So we're going to look at them today. But before we get to them, biblical prophecies are the foretelling of future events by God. They fall into three basic categories. 
those that will happen, those that have happened, and those that are happening. Uh, Judy Goodyear just stopped my office and she was watching uh, Dr. Jeremiah, Dan is it Daniel? David. David Jeremiah, and he said right now there are 10 prophecies being fulfilled, actively being fulfilled. Now I didn't research that, that's what he said. But it does feel like we're in a time of prophecy being fulfilled. Even COVID, I think, I think that is a biblical prophecy that is playing out. I could be wrong. I didn't do enough research to say that, certainly. Uh, but man, it, it is certainly a historic time that we are living in. And you know, the third one is those prophecies that are happening right now. So those are often mysterious and we can miss them. But we have the gift of hindsight we can look back at things that have happened. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some Old Testament prophecies and how to record it in the New Testament, just a few of them, all revolving around the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. So the prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. And then if we look at Matthew, now understand, Matthew was an Israelite, he was a Jew, he would have known the Old Testament, he probably could have recited this verse, and that's probably why he wrote it down. It's almost a word for word copy. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, here's the thing, especially if you go back and look at Isaiah, because anybody could go back, you know, you could open Isaiah and write it down like Matthew might have done. But if you go back to the original prophecy in Isaiah, look at some of the specific details he gives here. The Lord will give you a sign that the virgin will conceive. Now this would have been something the average person would say, that's just crazy. A virgin cannot conceive because she has never had sexual relations. She cannot become pregnant. Now if that's a medical fact or not, I do not know for sure. Uh, it seems to be, but I don't know enough about medical stuff to say that that is factual and give birth to a son. So it could have been a daughter, but it says son. So right there, you got about a 50-50 shot. You know, you could get that right, you could get it wrong. And we'll call him, and this part is critical, Emmanuel, which means, as Matthew points out, God with us. So this prophecy is, it's kind of really zoomed in. It's kind of like saying, there will be a cure for the common cold in the year 2015, and this is how it's gonna work. You're gonna go to your doctor's office and blah, blah, blah. Except God gets it right. Sylvia Brown, not so much. Not to pick on Sylvia Brown, she's just one of the few that I'm familiar with. So if we look at another one, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah. <coughs> see, I guess sorry, Gail told me how to pronounce this, and last week I was butcher, still butchering it. Now I think I got it for a while at least. Bethlehem Ephrathah. Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. I, I love the way that, that that mystery is built into the end there, like this almost like this boom prophetic voice, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And then Matthew, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So notice what Matthew does here as he's recording the fulfillment of this prophecy is if you go back to Micah, Micah says, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Now I gave, I talked about this, what was it last week or two weeks ago? Bethlehem Ephrathah. There were two Bethlehems. So Micah is saying specifically of the two Bethlehems there are in Israel, it's going to be Bethlehem Ephrathah. But notice Matthew doesn't say that. What Matthew says is Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Both of those specify the same Bethlehem. Now it's not the other Bethlehem. It, you know, it's kind of like, what, what town are there multiple ones of? Uh, New Cumberland. You know, every once in a while I get a call, hey, can, I, can you help us with some food? I'm like, yeah, sure, I could do that. Where are you at? And they're like, well, we're here in New Cumberland. All right. I said, could you stop by the church? And I, to cut to the chase, the person's in North Carolina. 
there's a new Cumberland, North Carolina. Yeah, I could help you with food. Just stop, stop by the church, right? If you could afford to drive here, you might just want to go to the grocery store yourself, not to send. Uh, but that's, you know, the specific and these details are important. Uh, so, from the clan of Judah, let's, let's continue reading on. So, Micah 5.2, I'm copying to the next page, so I'm not going to repeat that. But then we look at John, who Chris Reynolds' class is a small group is going to be reading through. You'll get to this probably in half a year. Uh, so John 7.42, does not, this is Jesus speaking, I believe, does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? So we see John reflecting back to Micah and probably some other prophecies about the birth of Christ. But does not Scripture, now this is talking about the Old Testament Scripture, the Word of God, say that the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived. So again, you get this little town, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Bethlehem in Judah, and Bethlehem, David's town. So you have all of this like clarification and um, like this proving of what the scriptures say in different ways because people would have understood it differently. When they talked about the town of Bethlehem, they would have referred to it a little differently. Um, you know, it's like Harrisburg. Some people call it the Burg. Some people use different names. But you're all talking about the same place. I don't know the other names. Don't question me. I don't know. Anyway, uh, even though I, I lived over there for a while. Um, so we see John, once again, verifying, just like Matthew did, the prophecies being fulfilled in Micah. So here's the third one, and the last one I'm going to look at. Samuel. Now, Samuel was a prophet, and I believe that he is, this is about David. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And then in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So if you would turn to Matthew, the first chapter, this is how the book of Matthew starts. This is the genealogy of Jesus. And if you look through that genealogy, you can see that David and Abraham, and is, is Matthew the one who's all the way back to Noah or um, Adam? I forget. One of them does. It's either Luke. But anyway, so this genealogy is, is and was really important to them that they could list it. How many generations could you go back and list from your personal knowledge, not that you went on like genealogy.com or something and paid somebody else to do it. I could list my parents. My grandparents, I never knew any of them. You know, my parents were both late kids in huge families. I was the last kid in a big family. Like, I didn't know my grandparents. I, I could probably tell you a couple of their names, but not all four of them. My grandparents, my great-grandparents rather, I have no idea. They came over from Slovakia. I never met them, didn't know them. You know, my dad didn't really talk about them. Uh, so genealogy to me, far less important than it would be for them. For them, for the Jews, for the Israelites, it was critical. And they knew that this line of David that came from Abraham, you know, and most of you know the story about Abraham, right? I will create a nation that is, has more people in it than you can count the stars. You know, so from this, I believe because of these prophecies, they were intentionally watching and tracking this genealogy because they knew the Messiah had to come from it. And the Messiah had to come out of the town that David was born in. So I come from this little village I mentioned last week or the week before called Reynolds, like 100 people there. Like if you include Clamtown, okay, 300 people maybe, I don't know. Like in Reynolds, nobody's ever born in Reynolds. At least I don't know of anybody who's ever born in Reynolds. There's no hospital there. There's they're not even like the veterinary thing. Like, there's no reason anybody would want to be born in Reynolds. In fact, if you're going to give poor birth, you want to get out of Reynolds. <laughs> there is a river, the Little Scopo River though. But anyway, uh, but you know, some people do give birth at home. I don't know what's wrong with them, but like Gail did that. Uh, you could ask her, I don't know. Like we couldn't get to the hospital quick enough. Um, so to think that somebody, like you think about the United States, how big it is, 300 million people or whatever. And somebody's gonna, like this year, 
You can have all these babies born, whatever, and what are the odds one of them will be born in Reynolds, the Reynolds that I'm from? Probably none will be born there this year. And that's kind of what this was like. This little town of, of this town where David was born, this Bethlehem, Ephrathah, like you don't go there to have a baby. You probably get out of there to have a baby. But Mary went with her husband, husband, uh, betrothed husband, if you will, and happened to be there when she had her baby. Now think about that. She was pregnant. She had no reason to go there except whoever was ruling at the time said, you have to go back, everybody go back to your hometown and register for the census. Now God knew this. So, you know, Mary and Joseph, they come in and she's probably sitting on a donkey or whatever and they get into this Bethlehem Ephrathah, the middle of nowhere, right? And lo and behold, she goes into labor and has a baby, has a baby boy, and all this stuff happens. Again, all of this, prophecy fulfilled. And there are dozens of distinct prophecies with details about the birth of Jesus Christ because he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the promised one, the anointed one. Now, keep in mind, you are hearing this as like, yeah, we know, we heard this before, we get it. Yeah, it's because you're 2,000 years later and for us, it's history. We could read about it, we have read about it. I have probably read about this stuff hundreds of times. Many of you have too, or at least dozens of times. Like, yeah, Pastor, you're not telling us anything new. But let's go back, like Matthew and John that recorded this. They lived it. It happened in their lifetime. They were there. Like maybe not at the birth, but they knew Jesus. They didn't get to speak with his mother, with his dad. And then if you go back to the prophets, you know, whether it's Samuel, David, Micah, Isaiah. They were writing about something that had not happened and would not happen for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Now there are 400 years between Malachi and the New Testament, so we know there's that 400 year gap, and then each of them are hundreds of years before that. This is really far more incredible than we understand. If I ask you, make a prediction about something that's gonna happen 800 years from now, like, you, does anybody have a clue? 800, well, let's go back. What, 800 years ago, the United States didn't exist. Like, you couldn't predict that 800 years ago. Well, there's going to be this nation. They're going to become this superpower and, you know, have nuclear missiles. And you're like, yeah, right. Like, who's going to predict that? But that's the type of thing we're talking about. This fulfillment of prophecy. Now, you're familiar with this saying, right? Trust the science. And it's a reasonable statement. And right now, for some reason, it's maybe more controversial. But we do need to trust the science. So, or so well, well, <laughs> when you do analysis of future events scientifically, you strongly consider past events. You look for trends in the data. So here's the thing with science. The way that science works, and this isn't really even my opinion, it's just the way science works. Science comes up with an explanation for something that they think is right. And they do testing, there's you know, and more information is found. And then when they find out that what they believe to be true is wrong, they change the statement, right? So we now know that that's not true, but now this is what we believe is true. And the saying is science is right until it's wrong. Based on all the information, this is what we think is true. That's science. But science continues to test the information. And it's right until it's proven wrong. So when it's proven wrong, you come up with a new idea or a new hypothesis, if you will. And eventually this process, the science, plays out until it is right. And eventually, science will get it right. So science is right until it's wrong. But the other side of that point is science is also wrong until it's right. But we don't know that it's wrong until we find out that it is wrong. It's the science. Now this has nothing to do with wearing masks or the thing, it's just science. Is that fair, Sarah? You're like almost a scientist. 
Yeah, so, so that is a fair description. It's just science. It's wrong until it's right, but it's right until it's wrong. They're both true. Eventually, science gets it right, which is a great thing, even for the Christian, because science will prove that everything in here is true. In fact, it slowly is. Do you know that oceanography came from a Christian? He read about it in the Old Testament where it talks about the currents that flow through the ocean. And nobody believed or knew that there were currents in the ocean. So this guy, I forget his name, he researched it. And lo and behold, there are. There are like rivers that go through the ocean. Water in water, go figure. It actually created the science of oceanography. Proved it true. So, regardless, truth is true, right? Yeah, truth is true. Sometimes we don't recognize it or whatever. So, you could make, you could take past data, most of you, and let's just say today there are great snacks in the gathering place. Like, there are donuts back there, there are uh, those lemon and bologna wrap-up things, there's some kind of chocolate stuff you put on with these cinnamon crackers. Like, it's great stuff! And if you had to predict that I would go back there and take some snacks today. Now you're, again, on the history side of this because it's over. But during the Sunday school hour, it would be a pretty darn good bet, looking at past data, to say that Pastor Charlie is going to go in there and eat some snacks. Because I do it every Sunday that I'm here. Now, would you be guaranteed to be right? Or no? I could get called to something else, or I could be feeling a little sick, or I could be dieting. <laughs> just sounds so wrong. <laughs> but anyway, it would be a fair assumption or presumption to say, Pastor Charlie, we'll go to the gathering place and eat snacks today if you're there. And you would be right 99% of the time or more, uh, but you wouldn't be guaranteed to be right. And that might be a prediction that next Sunday I'm going to go in there eat some snacks, and you would probably be right. But it's not a prophecy, because it could be wrong. What we find with prophecy is it is right. So it's statistical analysis, probabilities. Science uses it. You know, I worked in engineering for 21 years. A large part of that time was in a product test lab. We tested products. We can't tell you that any particular product that we make would, in fact, do what we say it does. But what we can tell you is, with a 99% confidence, it will work like it says it does. Or, you know, based on the testing and the data, that number, 99%, could be 99.9%. Well, if something is good 99.9% .9 of the time, that means it fails one out of every what? Thousand, I think. I don't know, I've been out of that too long. But there will be some failures, and we find them through the testing. You do the statistical analysis, you test a certain number, like 30 was a, a standard statistical number, it gives you a pretty high confidence. But some will be bad. You buy something brand new, right? Sometimes it doesn't work. I just, I just bought something at the dollar store, and it didn't work. Like, what are, what are the odds? It's made in China. There's smart people. Anyway, something must have happened in the shipping and getting it to me. That So, this is how data is analyzed to predict future events, results, outcomes. And I say all of this because Jesus' birth was a moment when prophecy became history. It wasn't 99.9% .9 sure that this would happen. It was 100% because it is the word of God in prophecy. And every prophecy God has given either has come true, is coming true, or will come true. None of them have been proven to be wrong. And they can't be. In fact, the Old Testament goes so far to say that if you claim to be a prophet of God and you're wrong, that you should be stoned to death because you are not a prophet of God if it is wrong. It's important, even in this day and age, when the Jehovah Witnesses come to your house and offer you their materials, they have prophesied that Christ will return on, I think, five different dates now. They've been wrong every time, which makes them false prophets. Be careful of that, wolves in sheep's clothing. But there is 
one, I almost want to say prophecy here, that you personally control. The day you were born, in fact, before you were born, God knew what you would decide about his son. We're pretty predictable people, right? There are snacks in the gathering place. Charlie's going to eat them. Imagine the wisdom of God knowing you. He created you. But you have free choice in the matter, which seems counter-logical. Well, God knows what I'm going to do. I don't have free choice. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, he does. Just like next Sunday. I have free choice whether I'm going to get snacks or not. But you could say pretty certainly that Charlie is going to eat snacks. If he's here and there are snacks, I'm going to eat them. God is so much wiser than any of us. He knows the decision you will make about your eternal destiny because of what you will decide about Jesus Christ. Will you decide to give your life to Jesus Christ? Will you surrender your life to Jesus Christ? You know, there are some people, they say a prayer, I'm inviting Jesus into my heart. When I die, I'm going to heaven, and they're done. That's, Jesus didn't teach that. You won't find that in here. What you will find in here is pick up my cross and follow me. Come after me and die. It's about surrender. It's about obedience. If you love me, you will obey my teachings. Jesus never made it so simple and easy that people said, yep, count me in. He made it hard because it is hard. But with it, you receive life that truly is life. And I want to encourage you, you know, if you haven't made a decision about Jesus, try to do, make 2022 the year. You will make a decision. You know, open the Bible. Read what Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, one of the four Gospels, the people that knew Jesus, that walked with Jesus, talked to people who knew Jesus, and so forth. But before you read, pray. God, if you are real, if this story of your son is real, speak to me. Speak to me about my life. And then read and try to listen and see what God says. And I tell you to do it like this because then it's not on me. I don't have to convince you of anything. God does. And I believe he will. If you need a Bible on the table in the back, in that slightly raised area, if there are free Bibles, there are books for kids, take them. We want to get, get them in the hands of people that will use them. Uh, if you want a different Bible, I have some of my office better ones, uh, some study Bibles even that explain the scriptures. If you want any of that, you know, it's all available to you. Take it, use it. If you have questions, I'm available. Uh, you can go to the Bible study in John that Chris has started. You know, there are opportunities. You know, going into this next year, do you have a devotional that you're going to be using? Do you have a plan to read the Bible? Because we are tasked with a few things in the church, right? We are tasked to help people meet Jesus, go and make disciples, to help people fall in love with Jesus and grow in their faith. So if you have accepted Christ, you are in a position where you need to actively try to grow yourself as a disciple so that your flame is hot and burning, not just smoking or out, but also to impact the life of other people. My role as a pastor is to empower you in ministry to serve. So we will give you opportunities, but I can't force any of you to serve. You have to choose to serve. As disciples, Jesus came, I, or when Jesus came, he said, I came to serve, not to be served. He again set the example for us. So think about your next year. Are you going to serve? Are you going to study God's word? Are you going to spend time in prayer on a regular basis? You know, we offer the upper room free of charge back, again, into that raised area on the right. Take one. They're very good, and they're short, quick and easy. You'll get out of your faith what you put into your faith. You know, like I talked about the small group, you can come to worship time after time and not feel connected. But plug into a small group, you will be connected. Or at least the probability is much greater that you will be connected. So, Again, don't listen to me. Listen to God. Ask God, what should I do? If you would like a devotional book, let me know. I'll take you in my office. I got, I don't know, 12 of them at least. Take your pick. Something there might stand out to you. Um, it would take a few minutes a day. Let's pray. Almighty God, for each person here, I lift them up before you and for our online audiences. 
uh, people are watching, that you will bless them, and you know everybody's situation, you know who cannot be here, and you know who can be here. But Lord, you know the many that are neither here nor watching online that have just simply walked away. Lord, help each person that you are thinking of in regards to this congregation to find the next step that they need to take to grow their faith and help them to have the courage to take that step. It might mean speaking to me, it might mean going to Chris's new class, it might mean uh, finding a way to serve in this church. Lord, there are so many options. Give us wisdom in this matter and show us how we should go forward. In Jesus' name I pray.